we're challenged today with the question of freedom. I think we're all in some way on this quest, on this search for freedom in some way. But what is freedom to you? What does freedom look like to you? You know, when I go to see a movie, I'm usually suckered into the movies that focus on freedom. You know, being a kid from the 90s, it was all about Braveheart. Freedom! Right? We all find our quest for that moment. And many times in our own personal journey, we view freedom as our own personal right to decide our own will, our own path, our own direction. I mean, we fight for our freedom of speech. We fight for our freedom to how we parent our own way. We fight for our freedom of how we want to live. We fight for our freedom to carry our own weapons. We fight fight for our own freedom to hang out with whoever I want all those kinds of things. But what really is freedom? What is that? Because I think we need to come to grips to what that really is and what that looks like. In Jesus' day, in this moment, he was talking to his disciples and all the people that surrounded them, and the people were looking for the same thing we're looking for today, freedom. They were looking and seeking freedom freedom. In fact, in that day, they were so overwhelmed by the Roman rule, the beatdown of the Roman Empire, they were looking for freedom from that life they were in. Freedom from from the slavery of that political rule. And Jesus was trying to introduce them to eternal freedom. Something bigger than where their mind was at in that moment saying, one day we will get there. One day we will experience that. And I think that's what we view in our mind. You know, the freedom that Jesus gives, the eternal salvation that he provides, we think of it as a down-the-road experience. Oh, that sounds great. One day I'll get there. One day I may experience that. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 there's something bigger here. The eternal freedom that I am talking about is bigger than your mind can imagine right now because eternal freedom is an all all the time experience. It's not down the road. It's not one day it could happen. No, you can experience it now in your moment from the past, the present, to the future because eternal is existing. It's existing forever. And so when we see God and we see Jesus, we recognize the reality that he is an eternal being. He was always there before time existed. That will blow your mind off. I mean, when you try to grapple the reality of eternity, we always think of eternity of is always, it's going to always be there. And we lose sight on the reality that eternity means it's always been there. One day time began, but even before time began, there was God. And there was Jesus, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Even before time began, they existed Eternal means forever, the past, the present, and the future. And the Bible says that he, God always existed, that he is the same today, yesterday, and forevermore. He is always there. And the freedom that you are searching for is not just right now in this moment, is not just right now in what you're trying to get through in your day-to-day, whatever's beating you up in this moment in life. It's always there, the past, the present, and the future. And we need to accept expand our minds, quit limiting our minds to the freedom that we think we're searching for. It's something so much bigger than we could ever imagine. You see, the freedom that Jesus is talking about, the freedom that he provides, is all the time encompassing. That the past, his freedom is for you for the past. And so many of you are walking through your life right now, beat down, overwhelmed with guilt or brokenness because of something that happened years ago. And Jesus says, my freedom gives you the ability to break free from that. Whatever it is that's beating you down. His freedom is for the present. Whatever you are currently experiencing in your life today or tomorrow or this coming week, he gives you the freedom for that and it is for the future as well. Whatever you're tossing and turning about in your bed, worrying about what tomorrow will bring, he says, I have freedom for you 
at that for the future as well. His future is all the time encompassing. It is for the past guilt and brokenness and hardship that you are facing. It is for the present of what you're walking through on this day. And it is for the future of what, rest, what your mind wrestles with every single night. And for Jesus' I am statement today, he's talking to his disciples and he's telling them, you can have this freedom. In fact, one day, this freedom that goes off into eternity, I'm gonna go back up there into my place of glory, and I'm going to build you a home. I'm going to build you a home, the, the home that you dreamed of, the palm trees, the golden streets, you know, that little swimming pool in the backyard. If you want a hot tub, I'll put a little hot tub back there for you. I'm making the picture, yeah, you know it, I'm making the picture perfect spot for you. I'm going to make you a place that you dream about. And not just like this is a great home, but a place where there is freedom that you could never imagine. And the disciples say, hey, that sounds pretty great. Jesus, how do we get there? I want to go there with you. You know, they're thinking like, should I go on planes, trains, or automobiles, or something else? Well, I, I don't know if I, I, I don't know really how to get there. Where should I buy my ticket? What should I do to get there? And that's how their mind goes, because we think in the physical realm, like, take me there now. And Jesus said this in John 14, 6 through 7, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. And from now on, you do know him and have seen him. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the ticket you're looking for. You follow me, you will experience him because in him is the freedom and you will get there. See, Jesus is saying something really crucial. Did you catch the one phrase in there? He said, freedom is found in really knowing him, really knowing Jesus. Which leads me to a question. How well do you know Jesus? Do you really know him? Or do you just kind of know him? Do you just kind of have an idea about him? Or are you sitting here today and he's like, I have no clue who Jesus is whatsoever. I mean, I heard the name before. I mean, it sounds kind of cool. But to be honest, I have no idea who he is. And I think in order to answer that question, we need to come to grips with the truth that Jesus was real. He was a real man that walked this earth just like you and me. He was a real man that was born and grew up in this world just like you and me. He was a real man that faced the struggles, the hardships, the beatdowns, the temptations, everything that you walk through, the Bible says he experienced it too because he was a real person just like you and me. And I think sometimes we have a hard time at connecting with Jesus because we forget the reality that he walked this earth just like us. He experienced life just like us. And the Bible says every way that you were tempted, every way that you struggled with those temptations in your mind, in your heart, all those questions that you wrestled with of why, who am I, why am I here, the man Jesus wrestled with them too. That's what the Bible says. He gets you. And you might think, Bill, that sounds so great, but how do we really know? I mean, the book was so old. But it's interesting, when we use that type of logic, we quickly say older writings that we attach ourselves to or we trust, we say they're cool, but for some reason the Bible is not. And in fact, if you really want proof of Jesus, you don't have to look in the Bible to find evidence of, his, of the reality that he existed. All throughout history, every major religion acknowledges that Jesus existed and did not just exist, but he was a very good teacher. In fact, many call him a prophet. 
You don't have to just look at all the major religions. You can see other major historians that the world trusts throughout history that have acknowledged the reality that Jesus existed and he was a really, really good teacher. There was something special about this man. You can see, find all that evidence outside the Bible to showcase the reality that Jesus was in fact real. He in fact walked on this earth. That's not a guessing game. There's proof beyond the written word of the Bible. Which leads me then to the other side of this. If he did exist, and many of those outlets outside the Bible even acknowledge that he is a good teacher and a prophet, then is what he said true? Is what he said true? And so much of this hinges on the reality of Jesus going to that cross and coming out of the tomb. You know what's interesting too? All the major religions... And those historians, they acknowledge that this man Jesus died in this gruesome death. The catching point that they try to talk themselves out of is, did he really come out of that tomb? But when they try to question that, they acknowledge that the tomb was empty. How did it become empty? So I think it all goes back to, boy, everything that Jesus said is true. And the tomb is empty because he in fact died and he in fact rose again to give you life, which gives you every reason to believe what he said is true and is reality. I wish we could spend so much more time digging into the evidence of Jesus. We don't have that time here, but we can, if, you're, if you have those questions like, Bill, I, I just don't know, let me know. We would love to sit down and talk to you about all the evidence and the reality of who Jesus is and what he means to us. But throughout his journey, we see the man Jesus find who he is in his relationship with the Father. Jesus highlighting the fact here that, he, that you want to know the Father, you have to know him. In other words, Jesus' identity is very much in his relationship with God the Father. They are one. It fascinates me when you go all the way back to the beginning of Jesus' ministry when he was baptized. And when he was coming in to get baptized, do you remember what the, what the Bible says God said to him? The dove came down and the Bible says God said to, to all the people there, this is my son. You know those words? in whom I am well pleased. As a son, I constantly look at that scripture and my mind just races around, what was it about Jesus that pleased the Father? What was it about him that pleased his daddy so much? I mean, was it the fact that he was being baptized? Was it the fact of that, that he was so pleased? Some people say, well, he was probably pleased with him because up to this point, Jesus rose, grew up in this world and he in fact did live a perfect life. And so Jesus, God was pleased with him. I think it's bigger than that. Because when did Jesus become the son? When do you think he became the son? The reality is, for all eternity, Jesus has been the son and so when you really wrestle with this passage of he loved his son and he is well pleased with his son, this relationship was built for all eternity. Jesus finding the pleasure of being the son and the father being the pleasure of you are my boy. And this relationship that was so close and intertwined is where they found who they were. And Jesus says, if you really know me, you know my daddy. You know my father. Because for all eternity, my father's been proud just because I'm his boy. And I find who I am in him. And I am the way to him. I am the way to this freedom. You see, we find our identity in the eternal son who finds his identity in the eternal Father. Does your head spin with that? Mine does. Maybe I'm just crazy and weird. But my head just spins with that. Just the reality of that. That I have the opportunity to call the eternal Father my daddy because I find who I am in the eternal Son. He is the way, the truth, and the life. The challenge, though, 
to get to that point is how do we define freedom? How do we define that? I've said this many times before. I think so often we wrestle with uh, where we're going because we may be using the same language but different terminology for the language. And I think really to move forward, we often need to define our terms. And freedom is one of those things we need to define our terms. What do we need? What, what do we mean by the word freedom? And I think a lot of times when I say the word freedom, what goes through your mind is exactly what I said at the beginning of this message. It's more of a do as I wish, live life my way, let me go and do my own thing, the ability to speak my mind. But did you know there's a definition of freedom that says freedom is the absence of domination. The state of not being enslaved. That's one of the definitions of freedom. And as I prepare for this message, I wrestled with that definition. Because I fear that too many times we struggle to define freedom more of a, I want to live life my way, just get out, get out of my way, get off my back, and let me do my thing. But the more we go down that path of living my way, doing my own thing, the more we find our life, and not just our life physically, but more importantly, what I mean is our life emotionally and spiritually being absolutely dominated by something. And I fear there are so many of us sitting in this room right now that are absolutely dominated emotionally. There is something in your life that is dominating your emotional self. And you're just feeling beat down and beat down and beat down. And it seems like there's no hope in sight. And you just don't know how to get through there. People talk about the light at the end of the tunnel and you're like, there is no end of the tunnel. This is it. And we just get so dominated and become enslaved to those things. What's dominating you? What is absolutely dominating your life, your emotional self, your spiritual self? What are you enslaved to? Jesus said, many of us struggle because we don't really know him. He said, if you really know me, you will know my Father. And there is freedom. There's the freedom. To know Jesus is to know the Father. And to know the Father is to experience the freedom that only he provides. The eternal freedom for the past, the present, and the future. And following the path towards freedom leads to a life that you could never imagine, the joy that you search for. My friends, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no path to the Father. There is no path to that freedom outside of him. But because we tend to follow our own path and define freedom based upon I want to live life my way, We open up the doors to certain things dominating our emotional self and our spiritual self. And then before you know it, just like the disciples with Jesus on that day, they become what I classify as objects of freedom. Those things that we look for and search for and try to cling to to say, when I get this, then I will be free. For the the disciples on that day, they believed when we get our new king, to take over this Roman rule, then we will be free. And for many of you, it might be a financial thing or a work thing or a relationship thing or something else. And you make this the object of your freedom. When I can get there or get that or have that, then I will be free. The problem is it never provides the freedom that we look for or what we're trying to chase. And it just beats us down more and more. But as we chase it, it develops a passion in us and we become more passionate about the object of our freedom rather than chasing Jesus. You see, the object of our freedom stirs our emotions and it drives our behaviors that just opens up the door to more opportunities of things dominating your heart and your soul and your life. To get more basic, what is stirring your emotions? What drives your behaviors? 
Because so many of our behaviors are developed because of the emotions that are stirred within our own heart, because of the freedom that we're trying to chase. And we're trying to chase this freedom. We're in this endless cycle because there's this object that we believe, if I can just get there, then I'll be free emotionally, spiritually, and everything else. But it's like, it just never comes. I'm just constantly in this chase. And because of this chase, we develop more bad behaviors, more bad behaviors that not only does not give us the freedom that we want or desire, but it pulls us further and further away from Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And underneath all that reveals what you truly believe, what you truly believe of what provides you freedom. So let me ask you, do you believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, the true path and reality of freedom, or do you believe your life your way? Whatever that object may be in your life unlocks freedom in your life. Because all this does is unlock the reality of what is de- dominating you. What is dominating your heart emotionally and your life spiritually that develops those hurts and those habits and those feelings in you. But when you follow Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life, there you find freedom. You know how that path goes? I'll check this out on the screen. First, you need to hear the gospel. You need to hear it. And I fear that we struggle with truly hearing the gospel because we allow ourselves to be influenced by all the other voices that surround us. Because there are so many influences in this world. And that's what they call them in social media. When you go onto YouTube, they're not called celebrities. They're called influencers. And they're called influencers for a reason. And the reality is so many of us are so overwhelmed with influencers in our life that make us believe if I get there, if I get that, then I will be free. And we just go in this endless cycle. And the more you chase those influencers and the less you chase and, be, and just be patient in the presence of Jesus, the less you experience him. And Jesus says the starting point is just hear me. Hear my truth. Hear my path. Just be with me. Shut out all those voices and hear me. Which then leads to a point that we need to get to of confession. At some point, you need to be real and vulnerable in the presence of God. I don't have all the answers. I don't get this. And some of this junk I deal with is because I didn't, I didn't bring it. But I have to be honest, some of this junk I'm dealing with, I created. And I need to confess that. And then I also need to confess not just what my brokenness is, or my shortcomings are, but I also need to confess, Jesus, that you are Lord. You are Lord. I'm following you. Which leads to repent. Repent is just that Bible fancy word that sometimes we say it, but oftentimes don't really understand what it means. Repent means to go the opposite direction. I'm going this way. I'm going towards my heart, my own thing, but I'm turning this way and I'm going towards him. That's what repentance means. And I think that's where a lot of us fail. I'll take time to hear the gospel and hear Jesus and take time in his word. I'll have those moments of, Jesus, this is what's going on in my life. I'm confessing you. But then we stop at repentance. Repentance is... I am done living life my way. I'm done chasing freedom my way. I'm chasing you. That's repentance. That is a life change. And only there can we realize and experience the freedom that God is giving to us. Only there can we truly realize the identity in Jesus who finds his identity in the eternal Father. Paul would put it this way in Romans 12 too, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. 
He's saying, listen, repent from those things. Don't allow the influences of the world to conform you more to their way. You be transformed by the renewing of Jesus the Son in the relationship with the, Jesus, the eternal Father who will transform your life. You know, in the Old Testament, there's two people that just fascinate me that had parallel lives at the same time and in, in the same generation, David and Saul. Saul was a man who went from the worldly standards had everything it took to be a king. He had the physique. He had the mind. He had the wherewithal. He was the man. And at the beginning, he kind of liked God. But as you read his story, Saul continued to run after his own heart. He chased his heart. And the Bible reveals this man's life that ended in complete destruction. David, on the other hand, made a lot of mistakes. But he chased the Father. He chased God's heart. You see, for Saul, the object of his freedom was the life that he was trying to build for himself. And for David, the object of his freedom was the life that God was trying to walk him towards. The object of what we believe provides freedom is ultimately what guides our steps and develops the outcomes we have. But the problem, many of us want to walk those steps, but we are overwhelmed in a world full of distractions. There's so many distractions all around us that's trying to pull us in different directions. You know, right now it's, it's March Madness and many of you guys probably filled out your brackets and you're following all the college hoops that are going on. And I don't really co follow college basketball that much, but one thing that always fascinates me with basketball is when they go up for the free throw to the free throw, throw line to take the shots and you see pictures like this. You know, these guys walking up to the free throw line and behind them, people are just waving anything they can and, and whatever they can. In fact, you will go to games now and if you're sitting behind those seats, those seats behind the hoops, they will give you things. They will give you those balloons. You know why? Because they want those people to become a distraction to the person going to the free throw line because they believe if they can distract that person and make them miss, that will give them their heart home team and edge in the game. In fact, just a few weeks ago, there was a game between the, in the professional ranks of, of basketball, a game between the Cavaliers and the Boston Celtics. And it was, there was 0.8 seconds left in the game. And the, uh, the Celtics player, Grant Williams, went up to the free throw line. He, Grant Williams is an 82.7% free throw shooter. If you don't know how good that is, that's pretty stinking good. In other words, he never misses. There was 0.8 seconds left in the game. He had to make one shot to win the game. But the Cavaliers player, Donovan Mitchell, decided, I'm just going to do whatever I can. And while they were kind of in the timeout, he walked up to Grant Williams and just started jabbing at him and just talking and getting at him. Like, you're not going to make the shot. You can't do this. There's no way. You're going to mess this up. You know, you're going, to, you're, you're going to miss this. And Grant Williams, who went up there, who was one of the perfect aces at the free throw line, whew, missed the first shot. It got in his head. He just had to make one shot. Went up, everybody's like, he's going to make the second shot. Whew, missed the second. They go into overtime, Cavaliers win. And everybody went back and interviewed Donovan Mitchell after the game. He said, what were you doing? He said, I was just trying to get in his game. Because all I thought was, if I can get him off his game, we can win. We can win. You know David in the Old Testament? He was a man after God's own heart. But he dealt with some significant distractions. In, in intense moments. Later on in his life, he was older, maybe not feeling as great about himself. Because just before this time period, this man that won so many amazing battles began to lose some of his battles. 
And at this time, the Bible says all his men were at war, which was not usual. Because in that time, if their men were at war, the king was there too. But for whatever reason, David did not go. And I often wonder, why did he not go on this day? Why did he not go on this trip? And I wonder if he just lost some battles. He's older in age. And maybe he's starting to get down on himself just thinking, I'm not good enough. I'm not who I used to be. I'm not where I used to be. I mean, is this how it's supposed to end up? And he's just facing with all the mental and emotional distractions at this time. And that's when you hear the story of when Bathsheba caught his eye. He was in the slow point mentally and emotionally. And there she was. And these distractions pulled him away from the presence of God in that moment to commit some awful awful sins. You know, I think we have to acknowledge something. We have an enemy. We have an enemy. And that enemy's greatest desire and his greatest goal is to distract you. Because if Satan can distract us and get us off our game, then he owns us. And Satan wins when he can distract us. His ultimate goal is to distract you and me. And Jesus said, if you really know me, you will know the Father. You see, my friends, we are on our game when we are in the presence of Jesus. That's when we're on our game. We need to find our way into the presence of the eternal Son who guides us into the presence of the eternal Father. But Satan's greatest desire is to distract you with the breakdowns of life so that you don't find your way into his presence. Because Satan knows if I can distract Bill, if I can distract you, get you off your game so that you become so worried about what tomorrow brings or what life is going on in your life. And you begin to think, well, I need to figure out how I can fix this that creates bad behaviors in my life because I'm trying to fix this problem and find freedom in these things rather than find freedom in the presence of the eternal son who is the way, the truth, and the life. That's how Satan works. His main goal is to distract you away from Jesus. Because in Jesus is where you find the freedom. You know, when Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, Philip responds. He's like, as we all typically would, hey, that sounds great. So just show us the Father. It's going to be enough. Just show him to us, and we'll get there. And Jesus responds with this. This is lengthy, but bear with me. Read along on the screen. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these. Because I am going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name. So that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore. But you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in, the fa- in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. 
The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. There are so many profound things in Jesus' words in that moment. And I encourage you at some point later today or this week to just go back and have some quiet reflection on Jesus' words in John 14. But some things that I really, that jump out to me is what Jesus said. Believe me. Believe me. Believe that I've got you. Believe that I am the path towards freedom. Believe that no matter what you're going through, how big the mountain may seem, I will take care of you. And I will be with you because with you, when you are with me, you're with the Father and the Father will take care of you because I'm the eternal son. And he said, just love me. If you believe me, then love me. Don't love the object of the freedom you're trying to chase that you think will end all the brokenness or hardship in your life. Stop loving those things and love me. Stop being so passionate about trying to find the freedom that you're searching for and be passionate about me. Love me enough to let me lead you. Stop trying to fix it on your own. Stop trying to do life on your own. Love me enough to let me be the one who leads you. Let me be your passion. Let me be the one who drives your behavior. Because what you believe and love drives who you are and drives your behaviors and ultimately drives the experience and consequences that you walk into. And so often we find ourselves just overwhelmed and absolutely dominated emotionally by something. When Jesus says, I'm here, those things don't have to dominate you. Stop trying to chase things that you think will free you from that because it won't. Come to me. Come to me. You know, I I believe... Our heart is buried in a layer of junk, emotionally, with consequences and behaviors. It's just like these layers that we put over our heart. And in our world today, what tends to happen is we find ourselves acting out in behaviors that we know are not good. And we find ourselves just trying to fix the behaviors. And I get that. That's good. But that's never going to solve the problem. You're not going to fix the problem by just trying to adjust the behaviors. You know what Jesus always does? He tries to work through all those layers to get to the heart. Because ultimately what drives your behaviors, underneath that is a layer of fear. There is something you are afraid of that drives your behaviors. Maybe it's I'll lose this relationship. Maybe it's I will kind of not be well financially. I will not be able to take care of this. Whatever it may be. But all your behaviors are ultimately driven by some sort of layer of fear. And that's why the Bible says, fear the Lord. Respect him enough that he's got you. And there's nothing you can do outside of him. But there's that layer of fear that we need to work through. And we don't truly understand why we act out the way we do if we don't truly understand what fear we're kind of walking with. Because underneath all that fear, that fear is developed usually by some sort of a wound. Something in your life is hurting you emotionally. That's developed this wound, that develops this fear, that then causes you to act out with the behaviors that you have. And underneath that is where your heart's at. Jesus is trying to get through all those layers to get here so that everything else will come together that you may find freedom. My question is, do you trust Jesus enough to lead you? Do you trust him enough to get down to those deep, dark places of your soul to work through all those layers of behaviors, of fears, and of those wounds so that he can clean out your heart to find the freedom that you're searching for? Do you love him enough 
to walk with him towards that freedom. Don't let the devils distract you. Don't let the distractions that surround you overwhelm you. Walk towards him. Because in the relationship and the presence of the eternal son, you'll find your way to the eternal father and there is freedom. We just need to be patient in his presence. Will you pray with me? Father, we come to you now because of how good you are. Lord, I'm an impatient person and trying to be patient in your presence, Lord, that's easier said than done because we see all the stuff happening around us. But Lord, help us to stop trying to fix things and make our primary focus to be in your presence. Help us to work through all the influences and all the distractions that surround us to find our way to you. And Lord God, as we find our way to you, may you work through our behaviors, work through all of our fears, wrestle with all of our wounds and heal those that we may find a clean heart and follow you as the way the truth, and the life, because there is no other way to the Father. It's in your name we pray. Amen.